Live. All right, we're live. Hi. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hi, Adrian. You know I've been hey. talking to you for 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's updating on YouTube, too. Awesome. Okay, so let's just make sure we got it all delay, together. Though. Let me uh, refresh. Yeah, I see definitely it's going live on your side. I'm going to page. get away from this so we don't get messed up by the delay. Okay. All right. I paused it on my end so I'm not confused because it's a there's a delay. Okay. All right, folks. So today we're talking about Growing up black in America, our experiences, and um, how it relates to the minimalist journey that we're on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I so I just want to say, if you guys have any questions or comments, definitely use the hashtag uh, BLKMIN live. Also, to continue the conversation on Twitter. Uh, after this discussion, um, yeah. So, also, if you're leaving comments directly in YouTube, we'll try to find a way to check those periodically as we're having the conversation so that we can have that kind of interaction. We want this yeah. to be a full discussion. And if you're watching it, I guess in Google, through Google, Plus, there's also like the group chat area. Mm -hmm. So, you can yeah. also comment there, I think. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I guess for me, is I'll be um, I'm gonna be man in the phone here on Twitter. So if okay. I see something pop up on Twitter, because I can't do too many screens at once, y'all. <laughs> okay, I'll, and I'll keep an eye on YouTube. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, okay. Do you want to go first? Yeah, so I mean, let's let's kick this off. Um, so go ahead. Okay, I guess like ask the question again, and then we'll dive dive in and just let it flow. So let's just talk generally about our experiences growing up. You know, and what relationship or what understanding we had of stuff in our lives. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay, so I am from Eugene, Oregon. So Eugene is pretty well known for being like very environmentally conscious, sustainable, all those things. But my family is from Louisiana and uh, big city, California. And so they moved up here in the 70s and stuff represented success in our house. So we have a TV in every room. We had, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. we um, tried to have the newest car or a version of it. We had like several older cars that no longer worked in the but driveway. Still, <laughs> still in the driveway. <laughs> you know? A, yeah. So it was about <laughs> if you acquired it, if you put your money and bought something, it was yours and you kept it for as long as you could. And that represented some type of success or achievement um, in my household. How about you? Okay. So for me, my family was, you know, straddling the line between being poor and working class. Mm -hmm. But you never know it by looking at us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we were always dressed nicely. Um, Clothes definitely was a big part of that. And because, you know, we definitely may not have the newest cars and all that kind of stuff. But like I said, clothing and just like little knickknacks and like random things, mm -hmm. the women in my family would collect. Mm. My grandfather, he's also a collector. He would collect lots of random tools, he, cars, trucks, you know. Yeah. But again, it's just stuff that's sitting there for years. Yeah. But it's also, I guess, 
because we were poor, we felt that we needed to hold on to this stuff. You know, so, was, was it like a rainy day kind of thing? Like, no, let, this stuff is not used for rainy her. days. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it just represented like some some point of achievement or attainment, mm -hmm. even if it was just a small little, you know, knickknack. Mm -hmm. And like I said, always making sure to be dressed nice, that your house looks nice, um, you know, very well decorated, even if we mm -hmm. couldn't necessarily afford some of the things that we had in our house. Yeah. The interesting thing for uh, my family is that we always try to get stuff like electronics and things like that mm -hmm. but like what you're saying like we didn't necessarily have like a lot of money growing up so it ended up being like these bootleg versions of things and because they broke down so quick it would just be accumulation of <laughs> the same kind of thing in our house so you could literally go to our garage and see these sets of old tv sets or old radio they just for whatever reason you know broke down but we could never bring ourselves or my parents could never bring themselves to just give it to, to Goodwill or even like the idea of even like just, hey, you know, recycle it. Like to them, that equated to you're being wasteful, mm -hmm. you know, so. And just, I guess the history too, because like I didn't share where I'm from. I'm from Caroline County, Maryland, and I've lived in different towns throughout Caroline County. It's a very rural area. It's on the Eastern shore of Maryland. The majority of people around here are poor, regardless of your race. Mm -hmm. The majority of people are poor. Um, and I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, so but, it would be, yeah. Go ahead. I was going to try to jog the memory there. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but it's just bear with us. Yeah, no, we'll figure it out. Um, so, since people, are predominantly poor there and you're dealing with stuff. And I think it's easier when you're poor, it's easier to show your status through things like clothing and, you know, decorating your house nicely. So when anybody comes over to visit, you don't look poor. Mm. Yeah. 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 So, um, so then if, um, when you say like decorating your house nicely, do you mean like actually going out and spending money that you didn't necessarily have? Or were you just like trying to use the things that no. you had but made them look presentable? No. So, I'm talking so about going out and getting furniture, you know, making installment payments on it or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. You know, spending money on things like curtains, knickknacks, other decorative wall things. That's mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. Not wow. making do with what you have. Although my mother, she's very crafty. You know, she does mm -hmm. sew and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so she knows how to rework things. But, you know, she still likes to buy things, as did my grandmother and as did, you know, many of the other women in my family. Mm -hmm. um, they yard selling a lot. Thrift stores. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you think, what do you think the... Um, what did what does that say about like us as a people just growing up where this the success we kind of attach to is on actual physical things as opposed to like why not save your money and like mm -hmm. build wealth from that or build a business or build like sustainability like why why do you think the thing for for and I'm not trying to generalize, but, you know, because I feel like mm -hmm. I had the same kind of experience that you're talking about, too. Why do you think the thing was, oh, buy, buy more stuff as opposed to, like, save your money? I don't know. I think it's definitely different depending upon class. Mm -hmm. But even with the middle class and, you know, upper classes of black folks, there's still this attainment of certain things, you know, it's still high on our priority list. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think that there was a history of generational wealth. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we're talking about the history of black people in America, you know, slavery was a huge part of that. 
Yeah. And when people got their freedom, you know, you know, they were just set free. Mm. A few may have been fortunate to get, you know, a few dollars or whatever. But most people were just set free with nothing but what they had on their backs and in their shacks. Mm -hmm. So there's no, you know, there's no legacy of generational wealth. On top of that, um, you know, you have discrimination, systemic discrimination, mm -hmm. you know, making it more difficult for, you know, black people to get, um, you know, housing, you know, buy houses and do other types of things that are considered investments. Mm -hmm, mm hmm. So then how does that relate to uh, uh, like what we're talking about? One of our questions is what's the difference between black minimalism and then now the, a white white minimalism, right? White, white minimalists, you know, because it seems like they're kind of like the history is different. Mm -hmm. The reason why we're gravitating towards it is a little different, right? Yeah. And I think just speaking for some of the popular minimalists, you know, they have a very similar story where they, you know, they left their corporate jobs or they sold their big houses. You know, they started with something to begin with mm -hmm, mm -hmm. versus other people who are starting probably with nothing and trying to make something from that. Mm -hmm. And I think historically, you know, black people have had to be very creative. Um, in hustling to get what we wanted mm. yeah. because there were so many barriers in place mm -hmm. yeah i definitely see that and then also um i think the aspect of like with white what the white minimalists that i see on youtube that are popular i think it's mm -hmm. interesting that they focus on you know, getting rid of things like beauty things, beauty related kind of stuff, or that's kind of more of the surface ideas of, of minimalism where when I when I start specifically looking for other black minimalists online, mm. they go more intrinsic. It's like it it kind of dives more into like Afrocentric, like reconnecting to your roots, mm -hmm. like getting getting more spiritual. It's more mm -hmm. kind of things that are talked about with black minimalist versus versus what I see from a lot of the popular white minimalists. Yeah, definitely. That's that's definitely true. And it is ultimately a spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's more so for, you know, us because we're fighting against societal stereotypes, cultural stereotypes, you know, becoming a minimalist can really make you question who you are. Mm hmm. You know, what's your purpose? What are your values? At least it did for me. Yeah, no, I had the same experience because for me, it's the question of if I'm not, if success is not getting the big house or I don't know why I'm doing this. I'm probably going to be doing this a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's you know, okay. They say, that, you know, uh, so if success is not about getting the big house um getting the nice car spending lots and lots of money on lavish things then how do i know that i'm successful mm -hmm. that's kind of been like an internal question for me and then it's taken me on this journey of like oh that means i have to define success mm -hmm. on my own terms and that's a good thing that you bring up um in the post that i did this week on what is a black minimalist i quoted some comments that I found on Joshua Becker's site. Um, mm -hmm. He does Becoming Minimalist, I believe that's the mm -hmm. name of it. So yeah, it, was yeah, a, it was an old post. It wasn't even about what the comment section went to, mm -hmm. but it was an old post from like 2012 and there's a black man in the comment section, you know, asking if minimalism is viable for African-Americans. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what happens if you don't have those signposts or status markers um, to say you made it. Mm -hmm. Like how do people, how do you, how does your own culture view you and how does society view you as a black well, person in America? I could take it on like a micro level with the exchange between sharing this, this lifestyle that I'm developing in myself with my parents. Cause I mm -hmm. currently, you know, I live with my family. So 
when they, Same. I don't come right out and say, yeah, I'm a minimalist, but it's through the actions. Like, I'm always like, why don't we get rid of this? Why don't we consider having less here? We don't have to spend this much doing this. Why don't we consider? And when mm -hmm. I actually have that kind of dialogue, there is this pushback of, uh, of um, oh, you're... <laughs> You're just the, I don't know, I don't know the, the right, the wording with it, but it just, it, it comes across of like, why wouldn't you want to do, this is what you do to do better. You mm -hmm. get these bigger things, these lavish things, and just, so far as generationally, there's definitely that piece of like, coming to terms with it. It's not about um, chasing after the Joneses anymore, mm -hmm. you know? And I think similar to that, I also live with my mother. Mm -hmm. and she's a collector, mm -hmm. as was my grandmother, and like I said, many other women in my family. Mm -hmm. And, like, whenever I try to firmly <laughs> encourage her <laughs> to get rid of some stuff, you know, she gets a little pushback, too. It's just like, yeah, well, I paid this much money for it, or I may need it one day, or someone else may be able to use it. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that goes back to, you know, that, that, that poverty mindset. Yeah. Even though that thing may not even be the most practical thing to own, you know, it, it holds some value to you because you were able to, you know, you, you own it now and you may see that it may have some purpose in the future, even though it's highly unlikely. Mm. And what does it mean if I get rid of this thing? Yeah. That's really interesting. And so, I mean, with the poverty mindset, is that also kind of have pieces of kind of the scarcity mindset? Like you're just afraid that you won't have the resources to, to take care of yourself at a certain point, you mm -hmm. know, with a certain thing. So like if I let something go now and then like, let's say down the line, Mm -hmm. I do need something like that. Well, darn, I, I, let, I let it I go. I wasted that money, and I wasted my I money. I wasted and, my time yeah. or something like that. Yeah, definitely. It definitely yeah. plays into it. And it's, you know, something that I've had to grapple with my myself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, through college and even a few years after college, like, each – so after each semester, we would have to move out of our dorms mm -hmm. completely. So like, and I was doing like winter sessions, sometimes summer sessions. So, you know, three to four times a year, I'm moving this stuff back and forth from home to college, home to college, home to college. And yeah. in those, just those four years, I don't think I've ever questioned why I kept all that stuff <laughs> and why I put myself through all that stress and frustration of moving it back and forth, yeah. you know, every semester. Mm-hmm. That's interesting too. Like the whole the whole moving aspect. When you go to actually start, tell me if this is for you. Like the case, just in general. When you go to move and then you start unpacking all the stuff and you start realizing, oh, I have this. I have this. Where did this come from? <laughs> and you, in your mind, you're like, you haven't touched it in years. You can very well just at that point say, okay, let's just get away with it. But for so so long before I started embracing minim minimalism and mm -hmm. learning about it, I would have packed it away and took it to the next spot and then stuffed it somewhere in a closet and it was there but never seen again. Yeah, so there is definitely. that kind of like behavior, you and know. It, and I think it goes back to the scarcity mindset or that just in case mindset is why I kept taking it. Like, yeah, it's mine. And even though I'm not using it right now, I might need it in the mm -hmm. future. Mm -hmm. I have a whole case of craft stuff because in 2011 I was um, doing a lot more DIY, DIY craft and related kind of things and I went through this whole period of just buying all this craft related stuff and right now I'm not really doing much of that. I'm doing more like writing and more whatever the case may be. Anyways, I have that right now. I like, I spent so much money on these things and I really could just give it away. I could, or, you know, sell it on Craigslist or whatever the case mm -hmm. may be. But it's literally, and the, the step I had to take was I had to take it out my room and put it into my car. 
it's I'm it's been sitting there for at least six to seven months. Literally, it's a, a just designated seat taken up of just all these craft related stuff. And I've been telling myself, okay, Adrian, get rid of it. But it's just this idea of like, what if I get to this this moment of like, I really, I could be an artist someday. <laughs> you know? I could be the next whatever i should have that just in case you know so i still have that now you know that uh scarcity mindset yeah and it, it's something that you know i think it takes probably a good lifetime to work through yeah when you've yeah. grown up that way you know it's embedded in you mm -hmm. to a certain extent uh, and then also too it's just the cultural thing i mean we live in a very consumer base uh the u.s is very much consumer field you know society and like i said was earlier it's related so closely to success that mm -hmm. now that we're you know trying to practice minimalism it's like how do you redefine success and that's actually probably one of the questions i have for you so mm -hmm. what has how have you started to redefine success in relation to things and also to how you just live in your your everyday life yeah well i think for me success is more tied to the things that i can do mm -hmm. versus the things that i have mm -hmm. like i don't think about my possessions that much anymore mm -hmm. but you know, one of the things when I first went minimalist, one of the things I wanted to do is travel more. Mm. Um, so that's been big on my list. Like, how can I make this work so that I can go and experience other cultures? Or how can I um, start my own business? Or, yeah. you know, how can I do this live chat with you and build this community? Mm hmm. So for me, it's more concerned about, I'm more concerned about experiences rather than stuff. And that's how I define my success. Yeah. I think, I think what, there's definitely probably a common thing with minimalists because I, I stay the same, same way. I have the same experiences over things on purpose, you know, mm -hmm. that's kind of like a saying I have. And it, it, it just means that, like, I would rather spend my time, my energy, my money investing in quality community between people like you and I are doing right now, quality conversations, developing those relationships with my friends and family, um, not having to, like, even the idea that, like, if I live smaller or simply, I don't have to spend as much time cleaning up my house because it's already That's set. Yeah. So That's I what I want. All that time, yeah. yeah. Time yeah. is a big, also a big component of success. Yeah. Like, how much do you control your time mm -hmm. and what you're able to do with that time? And that, again, goes along with experiences. Yeah. If you're spending I less time maintaining your stuff or working to obtain something. Yes. Then yeah. you have more time to do what you actually want to do. Yeah. I mean, one of the like the societal things that we have is this forty-hour work week, right? And the the idea of the forty-hour work week is because it's supposed to pay for the lifestyle that we perceive as we want to live, like mm -hmm. the lavish vacations, the nice house, the rent, whatever the case may be. But what if you embrace minimalism on a level where you could cut down your lifestyle, where you only need to work. 20 hours a week and you literally covered all of your expenses and you were saving money mm -hmm. and you're still living a very fulfilled not not that you're um living without you're living a very well life like what that 20 hours a week of your time mm -hmm. that you'll never get back what could you do with that yeah you know so i think that's one of the things that minimalism is starting to kind of help me to kind of define you know mm -hmm. like okay, wow, I don't necessarily need to work a 40-hour week. I don't. You know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, that like, mind. And, that's not, and that's not equated to laziness, you know? Just because you don't. Well, to who, though? You know? Huh? It's not equated to laziness with whom? Well, I'm just saying, like, um, 
if you're if you define success as I don't I want to spend more of my time doing things that I want to do versus having to work a 40 hour week just to take care of my day to day then you saying like now I'm, I've, I've created a life where I don't have to do that 40 hour a week anymore you're not being lazy because you no longer partake in that 40 hour week you know you just defined your life in, a, in terms that work for you. you so I guess you, that, yeah, go ahead. I think that brings up, I guess, perception, your perception of which, what is success. And then I guess back to what society's perception is. Yeah. Like, yeah. Have, have you experienced like any pushback from your family or friends about, you know, your personal decision to live your life the way that you do? Oh yeah. All the way. Um, I think, um, it's, it's probably like the source of one of like, I did that video on fear. It's mm -hmm. what's like the source of, uh, fear for me where I live my life on my terms, but is it going to be in exchange for my happiness or their happiness? Mm -hmm. So um if i'm living my life exactly how i wanted to live i'm not hurting nobody whatever the case may be but it's not the typical life that what society says or even your family says you should be living if it affects their happiness you know whether it's like they're kind of giving me pushback on it should i be doing that like there's those kind of questions that come up for, mm -hmm. for, for me you know because uh um, so I guess is that is that what is I don't know if that's what you mean by the question. <laughs> I, I want to try to stay on point to the question. No, you're good. Yeah, I mean the question was yeah. just how how have people you know perceive your change, your lifestyle change? I think I think it shows up in different ways. Um, you know my my friends they see they see it as oh wow. Um, you know, you're not you're not necessarily doing the same thing I'm doing, you know, because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you're not trying to, like, like I said, spend tons of money on on lavish things. Um, I think with my family. I think they they one of the things is I spend a lot of time alone, like thinking and processing and doing like reading and stuff. And so I think they perceive it as like, oh, you're being um, secluded too secluded. You know, mm -hmm. you don't spend enough time like out with us doing whatever the case may be. But uh, I think one of the things with minimalism that I've I've developed is like being OK to be alone and like spend time like mm -hmm. with yourself. Like it's OK to be like in your thoughts. And and um, I think minimalism has kind of like made that OK. So. There's that. How about you? Maybe you can now, answer the question better. I don't know. <laughs> well, I, can, I don't know if I can answer it better because that hasn't been my experience. Okay. So um, I'm pretty like, I don't know if stubborn is a word, but mm -hmm. I do what I do and people don't question me. Oh, they, might, they might be curious and, you know, they ask those type of I ask, you know, certain questions, but uh -huh. I've never got like direct pushback for being a minimalist. Mm -hmm. But I've also never even used that term. Do you use the term with, with your family? I don't use to say I don't use the term. <laughs> I don't be That's like like I, I, I don't go like I'm a minimalist. <laughs> Guess what, guys? <laughs> <You know? laughs> But I think they see it more in the choices that I make, you know, mm -hmm. like I like I'm just more comfortable with doing something that doesn't require this big flashy thing than not. And um, that might cause people to have questions like, well, why don't you make why don't you do this? This is what everyone else would have done, you know, and so, I'm just like, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. How is our experience? How is the black experience different? Because I don't know that we've answered that necessarily. I feel mm -hmm. like the things that we're talking about are very typical um, of many Americans. Mm -hmm. 
mm. who are embracing minimalism and just growing up in this country in general. Mm -hmm. I guess maybe it speaks more to a class issue than a race. I think but there is something different. Well, I think you hit on it in the beginning where it's the common way that people come to minimalism. I think it might be different for black folks than um, than white folks. Not saying, not saying. Uh, now, I think it also ties into the classism piece too, mm -hmm. because in, especially in today's world, there's a the, more people are becoming you know poor than than you know not, and mm -hmm. because of that we're starting to have a similar experience in that aspect too. Um, so I think it's more about like how you might come to it like i think with with the black experience especially if you come from a place of like not having much and having it mm. come up, then the idea of minimalism is not too far of a stretch in in the aspect of like i don't have the money to do to to uh purchase a lot of things anyway so the idea of living without doesn't necessarily it's not too big of a stretch I think, I think it is a stretch for some. Well, here's the difference. Here's the difference. I think when you, um, it's not a stretch, but then like, I don't know how to put this in wording, but the, I guess the desire to want to get more, you lose when you embrace the minimalism part, you know? Because like we said, we talked earlier about keeping up with the Joneses, right? A lot, there's a lot of this, like, I want to mm -hmm. have the flashy things, but you just based on money in your pocket, you can't, as a lot of, you know, the black experience, the difference with minimalism comes in and it's like, okay, I lost that desire to want to have the necessarily mm -hmm. the flashy things. And I think that's maybe different. But I still think that's more that's more class though. That's more race. class? I think so. Yeah. But going back to what you were saying originally, it is a stretch for some because even though they know they can't directly afford it, they still get it mm -hmm. somehow, or they still long for it. Mm -hmm. And I think that creates a little bit of mental anguish when you want something that you can't have. Mm. So that is what, is minimalism that solution to that then, or? Mm, I mean, I think it would depend. I think you have to get, I think that's that mental, emotional, maybe spiritual piece that you have to go through in order to stop desiring it mm -hmm. and to realize that you don't actually need it and that you can do a whole lot with the little bit that you have, mm -hmm. you know, making a dollar out of 15 cents. Yeah. So then, well then, okay. Well then if we haven't really hit on how is that different for race, is, is there anything else we could think of? Because this is interesting because we thought mm -hmm. this was going to be more of a discussion of, oh, this is the black experience and how it could be different from other people, other backgrounds. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like in the conversation, there's this idea of classism that's even a bigger kind of experience, too, that um, it's part of it, you know? Yeah. So. That's interesting. I think there is a race component to it, but maybe we haven't gotten that deep yet. Yeah. So how long have you actively been practic practicing minimalism in, in your life? A little over three years. Okay, so I started, um, I guess, December 2012. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and I was, yeah, probably, probably, 2013, something mm -hmm. like that. 2013 was when I like acted. Um, in 2011, I ended up having a lot of things happen to me where financially I had to do it naturally. Like it mm -hmm. just had to happen. But I think I'm, in 2013 is when I like recognized, oh, this is actually like a lifestyle move, movement. It's not a bad thing, you know? Right. So um, that's when I was like, okay. Let me let me look into this more. So yeah, that might be part of it too. Is that you know it's, we're still pretty new in it, you know, the yeah. idea of it. But I still feel a difference. Perhaps we can't you articulate do. it. Mm -hmm. 
but it feels differently. Mm -hmm. Do you think it has more to do with, um, let's see. Is it, does so we've been talking about a lot about just like the your the experience, but do you think it's more in like there's other pieces to it which were which further conversation we're having? Like I know we have a topic talking about you know natural hair and mm -hmm. things like that, and just like you how you how you perceive like your actions and how those we have those kind of discussions coming up. Do you think all those pieces together kind of? I think that, that will, I think that I think that will clarify it. Yeah. So this is more of a audience. This is more of a to be continued. <laughs> right. <laughs> so maybe <laughs> maybe the goal after this series will have a better understanding of you know what is that the difference there you know. Yeah, because I think I mean I think a lot of our experiences growing up are definitely tied to class, as we're you know speaking about right now. They seem very class focused. Uh, you cut out a little bit. What did you say? Uh, I said a lot of the things that we've shared about our own personal experiences seem very like class focused. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like it centers around poverty. But, yeah. you know, am I still cutting Which, out? I mean, are we still breaking up? Are you, can you hear me? You're breaking up. Yeah, you're breaking up on my side too. Um, what were we saying? So but this is a lot of class focus. Statistically, there are more black people in poverty. I think it's like 40% mm -hmm. of black children go up in poverty. So statistically, we're more inclined um, to grow up poor. Well, I mean, and then also to bring this, and I think maybe this might be a part of how we do that, break these conversations down. There's going to be pieces that come back because just the whole idea of slavery is a yeah. race class thing. That's mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. much a race class mm -hmm. thing. So even though we're, you know, not necessarily um, speaking specifically to race is the reason why minimalism is different. Right. I think for the black experience, race and class are so intertwined. Yeah, they are. It's, you know, so. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so what, what time do we have here? We have a close, oh, okay, we're close to the, to the hour. I, this is actually we have like ten minutes to like the hour mark. <laughs> so. Wow, let's 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 bring it. Let's bring it home. Yeah. Do you did you have any other questions that you want to uh, explore too? Because I kind of like just flowing off, flowing off, uh, just the conversation. But can I throw out a plug to everyone who's going to be watching this? Is make sure to uh, subscribe to. Uh, Yolanda's channel here. She's also put the link down to my channel, Adrian the Minimalist. But overall, there's also a Black Minimalist channel uh, that you want to subscribe to, and then on Twitter, a Black Black Minimalist uh, handle. And we'll have all the details for you in the description below. But just stay connected. And also, if any of these kind of com questions or conversations that we're having sparks questions that maybe you want us to answer or discuss in future talks, leave a comment below um, because you're part of the discussion too. Yeah, and I think to go along with what you're saying, I think our next chat should be on the Black Minimalist channel. Um, so over the next two weeks, I'm going to work on that with you <laughs> to make sure we get yeah. it set up correctly so that these videos are actually on that channel. Okay. Um, so yeah, the next chat will be on the Black Minimalist channel. So if you're not subscribed, make sure you subscribe to that so you receive the notification um, for the next live chat. Yes. Awesome. All right. So this is a good discussion. We have, 
Yeah. yeah. Do we have a? Do you, do you put out the date for the next? Uh, yes. The next talk. The date is April third. Right. It's a Sunday. Yeah, April third. Uh huh. April third, and it's going to be on natural hair, our natural hair journeys, and minimalist beauty. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure we'll have a lot of conversation about that. I may see if yes. we can invite um, Pasavia to the conversation. She has she has um, a channel with her husband called Eco Conscious Minimalist, and then just she has her to that. yeah, and she has her own beauty channel that's just called Pasavia Monique. So yeah, maybe she can join us for the live chat in April. That yeah, I think that would be good. And <clears throat> again, if uh, if whoever's listening to this, because I think you could have up to like what five people in a live chat or whatever, mm-hmm. or more. Um, yeah, yeah. So if if some of you out there want to be in on that next discussion, again, leave a comment below and. Make sure you subscribe to the Black Minimalist channel on Twitter and through YouTube because, you know, add, adding to the discussion, I think, will only make it make this better, you know? Hold on for a moment. I think we have some Google Plus comments. What? We got comments on the first time. <laughs> we're, we're slacking. We're slacking here. <laughs> we are okay. getting our stuff so, together, people. Let's answer. We have a question from Aga K. Why did you first start being a minimalist? You want me to oh, tackle okay. that first? Yeah. So for me, so, oh, go ahead. Uh, are, am no, I no, go ahead. You got it. Okay. So for me, I was just fed up with my life. I was fed up with the nine to five. It was like an eight thirty to five or something. Mm-hmm. Um, just the the DMV. That for those of you who don't know, that's DC. You also include Delaware sometimes, Virginia and Maryland. This like metropolitan sort of area. Mm-hmm. The DMV culture, the congestion, the traffic, and just you know always feeling exhausted mm-hmm. and not motivated. Mm-hmm. Like my life there was draining me. Um. So I said, you know, f it. Uh, I'm going to move back home. I'm gonna get rid of all my stuff. You know, I'm not gonna search for a new apartment. I let the lease expire. Got rid of all my furniture. A lot of just stuff that was in the apartment that I didn't need anymore because I was moving back to my mom's house. So I got rid of all that stuff. And like when I started doing this, I didn't know I was doing minimalism. I just knew that I wasn't happy and I needed to make a change. And my first thought to make a change was to um, you know, get rid of everything and just disrupt my whole routine. So I moved back home. Um, I commuted back and forth to work for a while, but I'm that literally got, just like, <laughs> but that got hectic. <laughs> um, and then eventually, <laughs> I quit my job, and I decided that I would no longer be working full time anymore for any other person. Um, I bought. A plane ticket to Mexico. I went there for three weeks. I started coaching because it was something I always wanted to do. And the job that I had before, the job that I had when I quit was an academic advisor. So it was sort of like coaching, but you know, you're bound to the restrictions of the university. Mm-hmm. So I continued, you know, I wanted to continue that sort of, you know, helping people get their lives together, but in a more, in a different format besides, you know, a university setting. So yeah, I just, um, I got rid of everything, quit my job, saved up some money while I was preparing to quit, but not enough. Mm -hmm. Um, And just started doing what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a life coach. I wanted to travel more, and I just did it. There was nothing, you know, holding me back once I made the decision. And I started, you know, creating the life that I wanted. Mm. But again, I didn't know that it was minimalism. I didn't discover minimalism until a year later. I didn't discover that that was a thing yeah. until a year later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So is my turn? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if I could title how I came to minimalism, it would be like a series of unfortunate events. You know that movie. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Let me just snick it. Snick it. Yeah. Snick it. 
<laughs> yeah. And that would be, I'm not trying to be dramatic, but that would be it. So uh, in, two, in 2000, I'm going to jump around. So 2009, I got so fed up with being in call center work. I was, I've been a call center. See, yes. Amen. <laughs> Pray for me. <laughs> you know, so I have been, was so fed up and I didn't even know that I was getting just internally done, but just at that point of being so long in call center work, I got to the point where I was just like a robot. I was a tool in this big machine. I had no sense of like creative, creative expression. I had no sense of like feeling like every day was exciting. It just felt like I was just stri thr or uh, struggling just to get through everyday life, you know? And I was ma I was paying my bills, I was taking care of the things I needed to, but at the same time, I felt like really dead inside. So that's 2009. Mm -hmm. So 2009, I literally walked out my job, quit it, done, and um, thought that I would start an online business, but had no set of like business skills like didn't know how to create a business i just had like this extreme enthusiasm and passion and thinking that like oh this life that i'm leaving as an employee i don't want it anymore let me start a business maybe this will give me the freedom and the excitement and the things that i want out of life i started a uh business called soulful blend coaching so i, I did a coaching i didn't know what i was going to coach on <laughs> so i literally was just like I started uh, doing these weekly podcasts, just motivating people to live a better life, you know? And um, I got people that needed help with things like better work environment. And then I had one person that needed help with, you know, her man skills, like relationship <laughs> skills. And I, and I was like, that's cool. Cause I felt like in my friend circle, I was that person. You know, just to be that listening kind of sounding board mm -hmm. for people. Yeah, I felt the same way. So, but I didn't know how to make that into an actual business. So that fell apart pretty quickly. And so by 2011, I ended up having to go back into to customer service. And I got a job with one of the top customer service companies. I think, um, um, uh, and I thought that, that was going to be it. I would have a really good job. I was, uh, I ended up moving to one of the, my dream cities. And I was working this job, living in my dream city, had my own apartment. It was amazing. And just before, cause it was like a, um, 90 day tip to hire literally probably days before I was going to be made a full-time employee. Mm -hmm. My body, like I suddenly got sick and had to be hop hospitalized for seven days. And mm -hmm. so I didn't have insurance. Dang. And I'm in this new city all alone. And I'm stuck in this in bed, bedridden. And I'm thinking, what the hell? Like, <laughs> you know. And so my the job ended up saying, hey, we, we can't have you be out of work that long. And because you're still considered a temp we could just let you go without just cause. Mm -hmm. So I ended up losing my job. I got this massive medical bills. Uh, I'm, in, I'm thinking I'm supposed to be my, my dream city living the life. No. So I literally had to like reset, do a full on reset, move back home with my parents and try to figure out how to do life on mm -hmm. my terms. And so since 2011 till now is is kind of been that journey now at 2011 i never called it minimalism the first time i started tapping into minimalism was when i was on youtube and i found this tiny house channel and there's this documentary called we are the tiny house people mm -hmm. i don't know if you ever seen it i think so yeah and it talked about just like people purposely living in these tiny houses and like purposely living with less and like how much like excitement and freedom in life they were having. And I was thinking people do that. That's what like you <laughs> can actually do that. Like this is, and you're happy doing this, you know, <laughs> you know? and that 
made me click in my mind. Oh, this is like this is like actually a way of life. Like it's a real thing. To, it's a real thing. And so every since then, I've been exploring things like tiny house living, minimalism, living with less, and 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 now even like one of the things I did this last year is I've really been stepping into my spiritual practice and. I committed to like reading the the Bible this year. And I'm realizing this, and this might be kind of off. This might be its own little topic, but <laughs> hey, this is discussion. Jesus was a minimalist. <laughs> like real talk. Jesus yeah. was a minimalist, yeah. yo. Like the way that he like just focused on what he had to do in this world and then like walked around encouraging people and did what he was supposed to do. It's and funny how you, you say that. It's, it's funny that yeah. you say that. Cause let's let's take it back to growing up black in America because um in black churches, minimalism is not a thing. They do yeah. a lot of extra. <laughs> yeah. A lot. But if you start really getting into like that, but no, word, I agree. But, yeah. And so, so there's all now, and so now it's like a full circle. It's just like I'm experiencing all these new things on the spiritual level. Um, and as of now, um, I do a lot of volunteer work that is starting to lead to like actual skills that I could actually translate into a business. Like I'm actually learning what a business is about now. And I realize that is what I want to do. Like the ultimate goal is to be able to have an online business that I could do from anywhere in the world. So the first thing I have is freedom at all times to do what I want to do, how I want to do. And then also these aspects of community. Like I'm really, really passionate about face-to-face -face community, no behind the screen. I mean, we're doing this, yeah. but even the fact that it's live, that's just more like I'm getting real time engagement with right. people. Like I really am passionate about those kind of things. And minimalism has kind of helped me clear away the clutter, the mental clutter, to realize that for myself, and then actually start to work it, work it out. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And I think we definitely need to do a chat on spirituality. I think that would be an interesting chat: spirituality and minimalism. Um, especially when we, when I just said Jesus is a minimalist. I don't mm -hmm. know what folks is gonna say about that one, but I, I, I don't know. I really, I. More I've seen that before, it. actually. Like I've seen a video yeah. on YouTube. If you search that, um, there was a guy who made a video about that. Really? But still, I, I think it's an interesting because, topic. Yeah. Because there's black Jesus and there's white Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Black people and their Jesus. That's a special thing. Yeah. 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 So, well, that was right. good. Are there any more questions? Yes, there's another one. Oh, okay. Yay. Uh, this, awesome. Yeah, this is from BW Living Well. And she says, I feel like I've always been a minimalist without even knowing it. I've lived in various places, and with each apartment, I've never felt the urge to furnish and decorate, clutter my place with stuff. And if I did attempt to, it became a burden. I'd rather my money go to passions like travel, one or two gadgets, and beauty products. Have you met mm -hmm. accidental minimalists like myself, where it's due to their personality and not the person actively trying to downsize? Well, that's a good question. You I don't know that I have met any accidental minimalists. Yeah, uh, you know, I think they. I think for me, it's been. It's called a different name. Like what I is said, it like I grew uh, a hippie in. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I live in Eugene, <laughs> Oregon, and honestly, hippie is not an offensive term. So no, don't because, take it yeah, that that's way, folks. Normal there. But that if you ever come to Eugene, Oregon, you will know it's that um, it's like the '60s flower child culture mm -hmm. that's here, live and well, in 2016 in Eugene, Oregon. That's what it is. So it's they per, this is this definitely is a so I, I think I have but I, I probably have never had the like conversation like oh you're a minimalist but like you could tell that that's the way that they live their life it's based on experiences over um, accumulating things yeah that's so, I haven't had that experience yeah I haven't met an accidental minimalist in my yeah. personal life 
Um, yeah. They are firmly, you know, consumerist materialists. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, I, I, I rep this hood right here. But that leads to another conversation about friendships. And like, are, friend, are your friendships impacted by your minimalism? I don't think that mine have been impacted, but I feel like myself personally, taking a step back from relationships, mm-hmm. because we may not be on the same path. I don't know if it's, I don't think it's negatively impacted the friendships, but there's definitely been a change. What about uh, romantic? Because I think in the same way, like friendships or romantic, you know, have has that been an issue for, for you? Like, have you had to explain this is what I'm about yet? Yeah. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> I'm like, I want that problem. There's a lack of available <laughs> available um, black men where I live at. And yes, yeah. I do like black men. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's not I it. I haven't, ha- haven't had to encounter that yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, with my friends, no. I don't, I think maybe the only kind of like thing that's, um, change is that it's probably changed who I would initially want to befriend, mm-hmm. you know, uh, meaning like I, um, because I'm embracing this on such a deep level and it's just naturally kind of showing up of who I am in the world, then the type of people that approach me and vice versa to be friends with tend to be on a similar mindset, mm-hmm. not necessarily maybe to the extreme that I like, I am, but more or less on they definitely want to have more experiences over mm-hmm. things, but they're not actively being like, let me get rid of everything in my house, which I'm mm-hmm. not either. I think I want to, I think that's a conversation too. It's just, you know, that we'll probably need to have. It's this idea of like, it, when do you actually become the minimalist when you no longer, like when you only have one item? There's no end point. Like, yeah. I don't think it's a lifetime journey. But I mean, like, what I mean, my question is, is can when do you stop a minimalist be defined? No, no. Can you can you call yourself a minimalist just at the thought of being like, I'm a minimalist? Like, even though I haven't given given away one thing yet, but I have the intention to do that. And you have like have to have like at least fifty items. That's it. And now you're a minimalist. That kind of idea, you know? Mm. Well, I don't think there's a number. But you can't just say you're minimalist if you're not actively trying to simplify some part of your life. Mm -hmm. Like, I think you're being fraudulent. (laughs) (laughs) You, you And when they say the road to hell is paved with good intentions, yeah. Yeah. You need to act on those intentions. You can't just say I'm a minimalist but not try at all. (laughs) (laughs) To downsize and minimize. I'm a minimalist in theory. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, I minimalism mean, is, requires you to get your hands dirty. Like, you know, the journey often starts with the stuff and it goes in other directions. Mm-hmm. But it starts with that physical removal of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. For many. Yeah. I won't say for all, but for many people, it starts with those physical things. So that's that's my take on that one. Adrian. So you're coming out there. Oh. Okay. There you are. Okay. All right. So those are all the questions that we had. Um, well, thank thank you guys for questions. That's awesome. That definitely put yes. another spark into the conversation right there. So keep them coming, please. Thank you, Aga K and BW Living Well. I wonder if it stands for Black Women Living Well. Yeah, let's, let's, that's awesome. So are we going to close it out then? Because it sounds, uh, we definitely hit that time. Yeah, so it was a good conversation today. I think we will continue the conversation about what it means to grow up Black in America and the Black experience. Because I think we personally need to dig a little deeper into it. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you know, to have a more fruitful discussion. And I think with our upcoming topics, we'll begin yeah. to hit on different pieces of that. And then maybe we can bring it all back together. That's what and, and just how this conversation circle went, around. Just how this conversation went, there's going to be a lot of circling. <laughs> there's going to be a lot of pulling back. I remember when you said this piece. Let me bring it back. And now I got an answer for you. Now I got a response for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just in case, like, any new viewers, like, these discussions are very open-ended and informal. Like, we don't, we did write down a few topics, but we don't have anything prepared. So, you know, we're, we're going to be comfortable with silences and with saying, I don't know, you know, mm -hmm. also get comfortable with that too. Um, and if you, you know, if we are talking about something, um, you know, feel free, like she said, to jump in and leave a comment. Yeah. That, may, that may help us, you know, get, you know, wrap that thread of the conversation up in that moment. Oh, yeah. Because I don't, and, you know, you'll have to man those comments. Because, like I said, I don't think I could see the comments on my side. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that, honestly, those comments at the end there were really cool. So, please, yeah, engage with us and have those comments in there so we can not only um, have this discussion, but also steer, steer it in a way that makes you, makes everyone engaged in it, you know? Yeah, and brings value for you. We appreciate you spending your time with us. Um, and we wanted to make these conversations, you know, worthwhile for you. So the way you can help us do that is by, you know, adding your comments in. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So we will see you two weeks from now, April 3rd. And we'll be talking about natural hair and minimalist beauty. I know this is going to be a popular topic. Yes. Yeah, so bring your fro's and your <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, bring it out. <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, so that's going to be two o'clock uh, Pacific Standard Time, five o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Um, we're going to be right back here, or no, no, we're going to try to be on the Black well, I mean, Minimalist. On the Black Minimalist channel. So if you go to the description box, I have a link to the channel there, and I also have information about again the, when the next chat is. And, and if I need you, to put our links in there because I didn't. Yeah, I the black minimalist <laughs> link in there. <laughs> yeah. So, so, and then to continue the conversation as we're leading up to the next one, guys, B L K M I N live L I V E ha is the hashtag you could use on Twitter, uh, and we will definitely be checking that hashtag and responding and keeping the conversation going. All right. All right. I'm going All right, to everyone. Are we Happy spring. Bye? Today's the first day of spring, even though there's snow here later on. Like, oh, what? you know, in Oregon, we have gray, grace, gray rain right now. So, yeah, it's gray so it doesn't rainy. really feel like spring, but we'll take it anyway. So, it's warm up yeah. later in the week. <laughs> All right. Bye, people. All right. Bye.